Wengu Jisim. Ask old, no new. It's an ancient proverb that teaches us to look at our past to improve our future. It's a pretty simple lesson, but it's one we haven't learned in the security industry. For the past 20 years, our approach to security has been an afterthought. By layering security defenses around our existing infrastructure and applications. We all know the results of this approach. Increased incidents of our intellectual property, our customer data, and employee data have taught us that this approach is no longer effective. It's time for us to learn from our past mistakes, especially in America and Europe. There, we tried to regulate security, turning it into a compliance or a checkbox activity. We deployed security defenses to meet the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. And we soon realized that compliance does not equal security. That's the opportunity within the Asia-Pacific region. Learn from our past mistakes to transform the way you approach security by embedding security defenses into your core infrastructure and applications. What a better place to start that learning process than right here at Black Hat Asia 2016. Use the next two days to learn what's working, but more importantly, what's not working in the security industry. Challenge old techniques to identify new approaches. This is your conference to learn new ways from old. On behalf of all the sponsors, I'd like to welcome you to Black Hat Asia 2016. I encourage you to come talk to us, learn from us, and yes, challenge us. It'll help improve your overall security program. Please enjoy the rest of the conference, and I look forward to seeing you over at the business hall. Thank you. our keynote. Um, so I have a little bit of a history for Dino. You can read his bio in the book. But uh, Dino has been a player, uh, an active player in the information security space, I don't know, since 2005, would you say? Yeah, or earlier, 2000. He, he kind of came to fame uh, with Pwn to Own, 2007. But back uh, at DEF CON, what was it, about DEF CON 7, there was this battle between, so Dino... Um, was playing Capture the Flag, and the Ghetto Hackers, which was a really powerful force in Capture the Flag, um, were playing. And Ghetto had, I don't know, 15 players or so. And then there was Dino. And they were battling it out on this custom operating system using mandatory access modules that this guy uh, had, had invented. And, uh, and Dino came in second against the 15 guys. And he's always been really interested in reversing um, Pretty much anything from the days you started collecting VAX uh, and Unix systems and filling his dorm room <laughs> full of big old VAXs to getting on uh, Unix systems to getting online uh, to the internet, but you talked your mom into giving you the university passwords and dial up to the to the VAX system to get online. Um, he's also probably most famously known for writing three books: um, the iOS Hackers Handbook in 2012, the Mac Hackers Handbook in 2009 in his first published book, The Art of Software Security Testing, from Addison Wesley in 2006. He was named uh, one of the 15 most influential people in security. And like I mentioned earlier, he's going to come up and tell you how we should de-incentivize uh, attacks against the next billion users. Dino's currently security architect uh, and mobile security lead at Square, a company that deals with mobile attacks and threats. Um, one of the largest credit card processors uh, for mobile apps in the United States. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Dino Daisovi. Thanks. Thank you very much. 
I'd like to thank Jeff for the invitation to come speak to you all today. Uh, this is my first time in Singapore, and I would say that it's a beautiful city, but honestly, I haven't been outside the hotel yet. Um, hopefully soon. I do know it's hot out there, though, um, so I hope to experience a little more of that soon. So um, a lot of my experience has been in uh, the attack side of security. I've done security analysis, penetration testing, software analysis, and I've thought a lot about how to raise the cost of those attacks. Um, and how to make attackers' jobs harder. So recently, though, I've um, taken a, more of a shift towards active defense and building kind of defensive architecture. So I started thinking about how to better defend. And I've done that at Square, and we are now excited to announce that Square is actually in Asia-Pac. We have launched in Australia. Um, so that's really exciting for us. Um, and I've started thinking about how to... Um, change some of the rules of defense and sort of make things scale better. So let's talk about that alternate strategy. So attack and defense basically you know, form this continuum. And the way that we work are we keep the, the value of what we need to protect and the cost to attack it in equilibrium on a scale. And what information technology does is it is incredibly powerful and at you know, speeding things up, aggregating information, and in essence, this creates a larger value for companies and people who are good at technology, but also creates larger value for attackers to attack it. And so it's security's job to raise the cost to keep the scale in equilibrium. And so as IT is just, you know, adding more weight to the value side of the scale, security is adding more weight to the co raising the cost side of the scale. But what happens is as we keep adding more and more and more and more, the scale is going to break down. It cannot withstand the force on both sides. So I thought about maybe there's another thing we can do and approach this differently, and that is based on redu reducing the value. If, we reduce the, if security starts reducing the value to attackers as the focus, then we don't have to focus as much on raising the cost, and then the system will not accumulate so much um, just weight. And... The, uh, what my talk is basically about is explaining kind of this focus and this mindset um, and how we can approach security problems that way. And it focuses a lot on baking security in, which is kind of a common theme we've talked about this morning. And the, uh, a lot of the same solutions come out of looking at things from raising the cost or from reducing the value. Um, and those are the good solutions. But, co but a lot of the solutions that just raise the cost may just add expense without making it actually... Sometimes I'm not actually making it harder for attackers. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. And um, the way I started thinking about this, this talk also was um, I started thinking about bank robberies. Not in the way that you're thinking. I, didn't, you know, I wasn't thinking about robbing any banks. But I was thinking about why don't we really hear about the bank robberies like we used to, um, at least in the United States in like the 20s and the 30s, which was referred to as the golden age of bank robberies. And bank robbers were... Um, kind of notorious celebrities in a lot of ways. And one of them, his name is Willie Sutton. He has a uh, famous quote when someone, a journalist, I believe, asked him, why do you rob banks? And he said, quite simply, because that's where the money is. That's why I rob banks. Turns out, he didn't really say this, but it makes a good story, so we're just going to move on. So let's go back to 1920s, 1925 to 1930, which is the golden age of bank robberies in the United States, and take a look at um, what it was like. This is what banks looked like. They were large. They were basically cathedrals to money. This is the uh, bank branch actually near my apartment. Uh, it's an old converted uh, bank headquarters, and there are bank branches in the bottom. It is a beautiful building, um, and this used to actually be the main branch for the Williamsburg Savings Bank. And it was a very busy branch, um, not really a branch, but the, most cities had a small number of banks, and they had to really protect them because the value... Like, all the money was aggregated in these very small places, and that required a lot of attention and a lot of um, procedures to make sure that it was safe. And what this also meant was that bank robberies were incredibly lucrative. So um, one famous bank robbery in California uh, happened in 1925 on February 5th, um, where they, broke, they you know, stormed the bank, threw the, uh, one of the tellers into a bank vault and made out with all the money. And they took ten, ten thousand to twenty-five thousand dollars, which is roughly three hundred thousand dollars U.S. dollars. So what's that? Four hundred thousand dollars Singapore dollars today. So that's, you know, not bad for a day. Um, it's a pretty good take. 
And that's kind of what the common headlines looked like. And this is what the bank vaults looked like. Um, one of the other inspirations for this talk is I was walking down the street and I saw like a empty storefront that used to be an old bank and the vault was sitting there and it was beautiful. I'm like, these bank vaults are amazing. Like, look at, look at this just steel and like copper and all this cool stuff. And they're just beautiful. And like, as a security person, like, you know, we're fascinated by like defensive technology and offensive technology too, but like kind of can geek out on it and just stare at this thing for hours. Um, I think this one's actually at Credit Suisse, but there's a lot of, um, technology baked into this bank vault door. Um, you know, some of the notable things are there's dual combination locks. So that makes uh, a bank vault basically two-factor authentication. It's something you have, aka the, the vault, and something you know, the combination. But there's also other procedures baked into it. You have two people, dual control, so that you can't have collusion or kidnapping. And the thing on the right is also a time lock. So the bank vault can be locked for a period of time, and even with both combinations, it cannot be opened. And you'll notice a lot of, there's a lot of copper in this as well, and that's used to dissipate heat torches. So if you're trying to you know, torch your way in, it would dissipate the heat and it wouldn't melt down. So there's a lot built into this, and this is very similar to the technological arms race that we have today in cybersecurity between attack and defense. You know, we're playing this game of chess, and for every innovation and attack, defense comes back with an innovation and defend against that attack. We kind of do this dance, and it just basically kind of scales upward. Um, let's go back to the present day. And looks like I'm running a little bit fast. It's 914, it's 910, so my image did not exactly work out. This is what bank branches in the United States look like today. Um, they're, you know, in, they're small. They're in regular shopping centers. They're not exactly what you'd call a, a hardened target. And the security guards... If they even have a gun, they're not, they're not the most imposing force. And, the re and this doesn't really um, tend to be a problem. For instance, like if we look at this from a security person mindset, we'd say, this is incredibly weak. There's all these vulnerabilities here. There's vulnerabilities here and there and here and there and here and there. And I could attack it, and the, attack, the cost of attack is incredibly low. So I, I don't understand why everyone isn't robbing these every day, because that would be a great idea and a great way to make money. So fraudsters would have to love it. Well, here, I, had, I actually had to look for headlines for, like, bank robberies. I had to look up, like, are banks still robbed? Is that still a thing? Because I just never hear about it. Um, and I found a nearby headline. Um, a man near, in a city near New York stole $6,000 from a bank, um, and they made off with it. And the way he, ran, he robbed them was he wrote on a note, hi, I'm a bank robber. I would like some money, please. Can you please give me it? And they did, and then he left. Um, not exactly the you know guns a blazing you know great for Hollywood kind of caper that that we've uh, come to understand from the golden age of bank robberies, and that's six thousand dollars. That's less than the adjusted amount from the bank robbery in 1925. So um, this isn't really a great amount, and the reason that this happens is because there's just not enough money at this bank branch to justify the risk of a full a full onslaught and the risk of getting caught and all the you know, work going into it. And so it's not that this is a hardened target, it's that they devalued the gain. So there's just, the gain's not worth the risk. And I think that's an important lesson there. Um, but of course, as I started thinking about this, um, the news has a way of kind of proving me wrong, so I have to shift to kind of still keep myself right again. Um, there was a big bank robbery. Um, they tried to get a billion dollars, but they only got, only got 81 million. Um, it's a total bummer. Don't you hate when that happens? Um, but this was the, uh, the robbery from the Federal Reserve. Um, I think it was from like, the uh, Bangladesh um, kind of central bank basically trying to, or stealing the money to, and routing it out. The important point is that this was all done electronically. This was not a physical onslaught, a physical attack. And because we have centralized all the money electronically, and now that is where the vulnerability is. So let's talk a little bit more about how the economics of cybersecurity work, because um, I think the, we now have the understanding that cybersecurity is best understood through economics, because attacks are not um, natural disasters. They are not um, you know, infectious diseases, I don't believe. What I believe they are is they're one group of people trying to get money or some other advantage over another group of people. And economics is the way to understand this. Everyone has competing interests. 
and um, trying to win. You know, the good guys, we have businesses, we have institutions, we kind of follow these rules. And cyber criminals basically are, I think of them as just businesses with an, an increased appetite for legal risk. They're willing to break more laws um, to keep their business alive. And if you think about, well, my jo- I want to keep myself in business and put them out of business, that is how we fight cybersecurity. And the, kind of the dominant language and way that we explain this now is with raising the cost to attackers. And that's how we understand it. And I talk about um, some of the uh, pitfalls here. I'm not saying it's a bad strategy. I just think there's some gotchas. And I think because of those gotchas, we need to start thinking about it the other way as well. So first, what actually raises costs to attackers? So um, first, who in here is a professional like attacker, like cyber criminal? <laughs> I'm, come on, it has to be a couple. All right. Um, I don't actually believe there are a couple in this room. Some people think everyone's at the conferences, but it's not true. Um, so what we have, we don't, we're not actual attackers. We have to try and predict and understand them. That requires empathy. We have to understand what it means, like what their value system is, why they do one thing versus another. And um, in order to predict what makes their life more difficult, that's what we have to understand. And the problem and the challenge there is attackers keep their identities and their capabilities and their preferences a secret. If they broadcast them, they're not really being very good attackers. So that makes it even harder for us to understand what will make their jobs more difficult and what won't. So, um, you know, empathy with people, with people as hard as it is, with people you have no information on, that's even harder. So I don't think that understanding attackers perfectly is really going to work. And when that doesn't work, what happens is we, we do things that don't actually raise their costs. And sometimes this can get kind of silly. So what we do is we find that we have vulnerable attack surfaces, and we protect those attack surfaces with more attack surfaces. And to make it even worse, a lot of these attack surfaces that we are using to protect you know, vulnerable attack surfaces run with higher privileges. So we, in order for security products to often work, they need to run at a higher level of privilege on the operating system or on the network so they have a better vantage point, so they can inspect, so they can control. And what that means is any security vulnerabilities in them are even more serious because instead of having to escalate you know, <coughs> excuse me, from lower privilege, you know, a web browser and escalate to... Um, Uh, full privileges on the host, you might be able to get straight full privileges on on the antivirus software. And so there's kind of a pitfall there. And in a DoD study that uh, Mudge presented a few years ago, um, they found that uh, one-third of the vulnerabilities in government systems were in the security software installed on them. And this is the risk of securing vulnerable attack surfaces with even more attack surface. There's another... Uh, side effect of raising the cost to attackers and that it also raises the cost to us. For everything we build, we have to build another security system to secure it. And when we take this mindset, we are basically building a parallel universe of things, of attack surfaces, and all this takes time and effort and it just increases our costs. And um, because we know that correlation is causation, you can look at the graph on the left and say security spending is up on the graph on the right, Breaches are up. Therefore, security spending causes breaches. Um, but we know that's not true. But we can see that you know, the trajectory we're on, and recently um, there have been predictions that overall security spending is going to increase tenfold from here by the year 2023. So um, it's going to go from you know, $60 billion annually to $600 billion annually. That's a tremendous market explosion, which... Um, you know, while it has some benefits, I believe it's not sustainable. And it just cannot scale to the explosion of Internet-connected devices that we're going to see in our societies over the next 10 to 20 years. Because a lot of uh, that prediction on the spending is also based on securing the first billion devices, and those are PCs. You know, we're still working on that. And so I just don't see how you know, those securing those few billion PCs at that rising in, in expenditure is going to scale when we have what's predicted as 50 billion devices by 2020. Um, 
And when we're spending more on security than on actually doing something, I think we're not actually doing it the right way. So what, is the, what are the alternate approaches? What can we do to try and get something that scales better as we connect literally everything to the Internet? So the, the strategy that I think we need to spend more th- time thinking about is devaluation. We need to figure out how to reduce the value to attackers while preserving most of the value for ourselves. And the, the difficulty and the trick is figuring out how to do that and make it, you know, reduce the value for attackers, incre- you know, preserve most of the value for us. So let's talk about some of the ingredients here, and then I'll go some, through some case studies on how those ingredients um, play into things that you already know and use every day. So first one is the obvious one, encryption. So what encryption does is it transfers the value from the data to the key. The key is small. We can put the key in something like a hardware security module. We can put the key in something else that's protected. We basically put all our eggs in one basket, and we watch that basket. And instead of having to protect you know, data that is um, just you know, unmanaged or just spread all over our environment, we now um, manage just the keys, which is its own problem, but um, there's less of them. There's less data to keep your eye on than just data everywhere. And that's sort of one that we know and is pretty well understood. I'm not going to talk too much about. Another approach is what's called tokenization. So these are subway tokens from the New York City subway, like, you know, uh, probably like the 20s or the 30s. Um, what the idea behind this approach is replace something that is generally valuable and generally capable, like money, with something that is was more constrained, a token that it can only be used to um, enter the subway. And so then that means that stealing a bunch of these tokens is not as useful as stealing a bunch of money. If you have a, let's say, a subway operator who basically has a ton of money on them at all times, um, they're going to be a, they're going to be at risk of robbery. If they just have a bunch of tokens that can only be used to ride the subway, they're at less risk because there's less value. An attacker would still have to somehow turn all these tokens back into money, and that can't be done at a one-to-one ratio. So it's actually worth less. But for subway riders, it's the same thing. It's a little hassle to pay to buy a token, but it's not um, a big deal. Uh, another approach um, that we also know and understand very well is containment. So this is actually Singapore's uh, shipping yard. Um, apparently one of the largest in business in the world and looks great on National Geographic. Um, So containers, you know, and that whole idea are meant for efficiency. So in IT, we use containers to deploy applications primarily for efficiency. It's the same interface. We can take a thing from here to there, send it to prod. It's great. Um, The containment is sort of an ancillary benefit. And same thing with shipping containers. If you have, I don't know, some... Uh, barrels of oil or goo in a container and they spill or something, it's contained. And it's not perfect, but in general, it won't just go everywhere. And that's where we are with, with uh, containers like Docker and things like that today. They have decent containment. A really skilled attacker can usually still get out of them. They're not designed for perfect isolation, but um, in most cases, it'll, it'll contain an attack. And uh, same thing with firewalls. This re- these contain host access. Um, and at the beginning, firewalls obviously weren't perfect. There was many vulnerabilities that you get through them. But they generally reduced the scope. They contained the amount of access to hosts and data that an attacker would get by compromising a host. And so the principle there is you just assume that someone's going to get in, but let's limit the value of them getting into a particular place. And anywhere that has an attack surface can you know, devalue what they would get if they got there and just apply those tools. Some of the um, kind of newer ones that people are starting to apply that some of actually my favorites are immut- immutability. So the idea of the immutability is I want my system to prevent modification of the software and configuration. It's read-only. It's Even an attacker cannot change it. And this does raise the cost of system uh, administration somewhat. But when you are shipping containers, there's no, you don't actually you modify them once they're shipped. You deploy a container, it's read-only. And if you build security mechanisms to enforce that immutability, um, you get a lot of security benefit. And another place this is applied is to um, mobile devices and things like Chromebooks. Chromebooks use a special file system called DM Verity and you know, verified boot to ensure that it is immutable. Once it's booted up, you cannot change any blocks on the system partition. 
And uh, this is now in many Android devices. And unless you jailbreak or root your iOS or Android device, you have that same property. You need to escalate privileges um, to the kernel or even, you know, sometimes even higher in order to make changes that can survive a reboot. And then you can just reboot and it's clean. And the best way I remember this is um, thinking about the San Francisco BART system, rail system versus the New York City subway. When I first rode the BART, which was built in, like, in I think, in the 70s as well, similar time frame to when this uh, New York City subway car was built, I saw that there was carpet on the ground and there was like carpeted seats. And yes, it's more comfortable, but ew. Like, that is gross. Like, there, the germs can just live everywhere there. And people, you know, get onto these trains after drinking. And, and San Francisco is well known for populations that may not be as clean as everyone else. Like, <laughs> and where bathing may not be the highest, most available. And this, this is what they have. And I'm like, this is gross. The New York City subway, it's plastic. It's stainless steel. If anything happens, you can just hose this thing down. And nothing can stick Nothing can stay. And I believe our system should be that same way, too. Right now, so many things on our system um, that should be unchangeable are changeable. And that allows attackers to persist in very uh, subtle ways. And it's rootkits. It's all these every root, rootkits that anything you can think of. We've been looking at presentations at Black Hat for 10 years of, hey, there's a thing. Hey, I can make a rootkit for that. Um, I can persist on that. And it's because we abandoned the idea of making our systems um, immutable or effectively immu immutable once they power up. So another um, approach that you can use is flux. Um, flux is the state of constant change. And this is something that uh, luckily is actually very easy for defenders because this is almost our natural state of doing stuff. It's unordered, it's chaotic, stuff is just going around and we can see that as a security problem or we can also embrace it as a security benefit. Because what does this do to attacks? If I, so one example of this are modern web browsers that we call evergreen. Chrome, Firefox, they adapt very quickly. They make a lot of changes under the hood as, just a, mat, as a course of doing, uh, just course of doing development. And they change every few weeks. And these may not necessarily be fixing vulnerabilities, but they'll be making changes that break exploitation. And not in a way to actively defend against it, but it just happens to do that. They change how a memory manager works. They change object layout. Maintains that an attacker must always be trying to catch up. And if you are a rapidly moving target, it is much more difficult for an attacker to target and invest the amount of time to um, to prepare their attack than if you're a static, unchanging target. And if you look at where a lot of our attacks and software are now, they're against the unchanging, almost end-of-life software, like Flash, basically, and Java, and Java plugins. And over the last few years, it's stuff that um, was staying very static and not updating and moving quickly, whereas the software that does move quickly had some natural defenses because of that difficulty, outside of any explicit security features. Related to flux is speed. If you can respond very quickly, if you can adapt very quickly, um, you don't have to spend as much time um, ahead of time defending an asset. Um, assuming, <coughs> excuse me, just getting over a cold here still. Um, assuming that one compromise is not catastrophic. If, you, if things are rolling, you can adapt and um, respond very quickly to threats. And if you build that into the fabric of how you do things, um, you can, if not stay ahead, you can always stay right, keep up with attackers. And the uh, kind of this example is um, a, a plane called the SR-72 that Lockheed Martin is working on. And it is a, you know, the, the whole idea behind its design is that speed is the new stealth. They said, well, we can't really hide from radar, but we could just make it go so fast that it doesn't matter. And think about how this can be for security. You can say, well, speed can also be the new security. We can, if we can move super quick, we can adapt super quick, um, attackers can't attack us because they just can't catch up. And we can always stay ahead. And this is very intertwined with flux. So if you combine speed with flux, you're a, a rapidly moving target that's very difficult for an attacker to get a fix on. And that is, again, without any explicit security defense. This is just built into the fabric of how you do things. 
Another approach that's similar to this is diversity. <coughs> and there's a couple ways we can approach diversity in computing. So the first is what I call artificial diversity. That is um, what we have on the left. That is ASLR, where we shuffle things around in memory. And it's a very constrained diversity. It's like the same libraries are just moved into the same different places. And once you figure out an attack that is independent of this mechanism, you're done. Um, and that's not real diversity. The picture on the right is closer to real diversity. And what that is, is open source. Open source is mutation. You take ideas, you take code from one thing to another, and you adapt them in completely unpredictable ways, and they become something else. And this is the Unix, fam the Unix family tree of the open source side. And so while there's a common heritage and some vulnerabilities that may go all the way back to, the, um, to that common heritage, the way that they've manifested in the different systems are all very different and require an attacker to target them individually. So that increases the attacker's work factor without explicitly um, that being a goal. And that's something that um, you get a little bit kind of for free with an open source system of productive mutation. And I think as this, um, the kind of this sort of open source mutation is something that um, is enabled by more internet access. So this, all this kind of open source Unix operating systems came, were made possible by the growing internet. If you compare the speed of churn from this to the, the speed of churn of GitHub today and people forking and just code going in every direction and fragmenting in every possible way, um, it's now at light speed. And that same mechanism is now exaggerated so that um, the, the code is like, we, it's a more distributed vulnerability. And rather than concentrating all the risk into one you know, operating system image that a billion people run. And related to that is decentralization. The idea is you, you know, whatever is exposed, basically spread the risk among them rather than concentrating it all in one thing. And this is something that we don't really do very much today. The only systems that are in use today that really embrace decentralization are kind of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and things like that. And I think that um, we're starting to see some more open source projects that are building decentralization into their fabric sort of as a way to scale faster. And we found that um, it's, you know, some things like BitTorrent swarms are good for um, sharing large file sets internally. You know, some big tech companies use that to deploy um, operating systems and software images across production because that's way faster than loading all the software or having all the servers hit these focal points and overloading you know, that network fabric. So these are kind of some of the tools. Let's look at how these actually apply to the real world today. So Chris Rolf tweeted a while ago, in all his years working in this, in this industry, he's seen exactly two effective security technologies stand the test of time. Firewalls and two-factor authentication. Um, so let's see what makes firewalls and 2FA so special. So what a firewall does is a firewall devalues network positioning um, and reduces the scope. So it assumes that there's going to be a compromise. We reduce the value of that, and um, we do that through containment. And if you can't access very much, the value of that network position doesn't matter. This is true for you know kind of network backbone points and also for hosts on that network. And uh, this is a movie poster from a movie called Firewall that was about uh, a high-tech um, uh, bank, uh, bank robbery. And don't worry if you haven't seen it. It's not like uh, everyone in the U.S. saw it, because I'm pretty sure no one saw this movie, <laughs> um, except for security nerds who are like, ooh, it's called Firewall. I should go check it out. And I'm pretty sure that's why Jeff is smirking, because I think he saw it too. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, so we also know this from what's called Metcalfe's Law. Metcalfe's law is what we use to, has colloquially been used to explain what's called the network effect. The value of the network, especially like a social network, increases as the number, is the number of users squared. And this was originally um, postulated for um, Ethernet, so saying that the value of a network protocol um, increases you know, as squared of the number of devices that can speak it. And we can also use this to think about attacks. The number of hosts that are accessible from a certain network position or whose data is accessible from a certain network position. Um, the value of that network position is the number, that, that number of hosts squared. So that's one way you can think about um, how to you know, tune your firewalls and build your network architecture and make sure that all the traffic going through certain network points is encrypted so that that data is not accessible. 
Let's talk about two-factor authentication. Um, so Duo, Duo Security made a, uh, a re-edit of the kind of famous old hacker movie War Games um, that was this, let's see what happened in the movie War Games if there's two-factor authentication. So the basic plot of War Games is young hacker um, does, he eventually finds you know, a, um, a system he can dial into and accidentally almost starts a global nuclear war. Um, so let's see what happens if he had two factor, if the world had two-factor authentication instead. So he, uh, he meet, meets a girl, and he wants to show off, so he's going to, like, change their grades. So he logs into the school's system, and it asks for the password, and he thinks, ah, I know. I've seen where they wrote it down. In the, in the office, on a piece of paper, they change the password, and they write it there, and I'm just going to go in there, and he sneaks in, he finds that password, and now he can get in. So he types in the password. Two. And he, um, in, that, if, in this world of two-factor authentication, he's now asked for the second factor. Do you want to get the second factor from a mobile push notification, a phone call, or an SMS to this phone number that he doesn't actually have? Well, movie gets very boring from there. They just go outside and play instead. One, two, one, two. So, one, so it's a much, two, one, much shorter two, movie. Three. So... The reason why that is actually useful is Just because two-factor authentication reduces the value two. of the password to Check nothing. One, two. <laughs> <laughs> reuse, reuse. Yeah. All right, we're good. Microphone still works. Um, so if the password has no value, why not just get rid of it? And this is what Yahoo has actually done for a lot of their authentication. They said, well, people steal it, we have to reset it, it's, it's, it's annoying, and it's not buying as much security, so let's just do away with the whole thing. And so now you can log into your Yahoo Mail with a username and just a uh, one-time password that is sent to your phone over SMS. This, you know, this, the strong what you have is the SIM card for that phone number, and it has a weak what you know of your username. And yeah, there's a tax against this, but for the most part, it's better than passwords. And for a more secure login, you can actually just do, if you have Yahoo Mail on your phone, you can um, just get a real push notification, and you log in on your computer, and it says, hey, is this you? And you're like, oh, yep, that was me. And you're in. That's it. No password, much easier, and it's actually much more secure, too. And if someone's not logging, if someone's trying to attack your account, you get a notification. You're like, no, that totally wasn't me, and they can respond to it. So it actually gives very useful feedback to the security mechanism as well. So there's a lot of benefits here. And um, uh, Tony Arcieri on Twitter also mentioned he kind of captured this very well with, mark my words, strong something you have and a weak something you know is the future. And I agree with that 90%. Um, it's not the future. We're, it's already happening today. So there are roughly 3 billion two-factor authentication cryptographic devices in circulation today. And many people around the world carry them with them at all times, probably use them daily, and these are EMV chip cards for chip and pin transactions. Every transaction is a cryptographic two-factor operation. And this is deployed, it's usable, it's um, very common, and so th it's an example of why deploying two-factor authentication for things like our email should not be more challenging than this. Um, and as our information assets become worth more than just our bank account, we should have at least this level of security. And going back to what Tony said, that, you know, that there's a two-factor authentication is the strongest with a strong what you have and a weak what you know, this chip card that is incredibly exp expensive to clone or attack is the strong what you have. And just to make sure that you don't lose it, and someone picks it up and uses it, you have a weak what you know, and that is the pin. So here's a heat map of all breached pins. So the way that the um, author of this, I didn't make this, obviously, um, the, the way that the author created this was they looked over all of the breach, noted all the breached data and released passwords over the last, you know, whatever, five years, and found all the four-digit numeric passwords. He assumed that those are also similar to pins and that doing statistics on the distribution of those would be a good proxy for the... Um, the pins that people would choose for themselves for their, their banking cards and their credit cards. And you can see like, some interesting patterns here. So there's a kind of a strong diagonal line. Those are all the same digits, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3. 
And there's this kind of strong vertical line as well. That is one nine something something. People using their birth year, you know, 1975, 19 whatever. Um, and the kind of the cluster, the lower left, are all the ones that start with zero or one. People like those because they're easier to remember. And this shows that pins are weak. People are bad at choosing pins, but this is not actually a security catastrophe because of the strong something you have property and other things like pin lockout. You can only guess a pin so many times against your chip card before it locks itself. You can only guess a pin so many times before your bank locks you out. And as recent media headlines have shown us, even the four-digit pin on a device that is, you know, has strong security to prevent attacks against it can be a real big pain. So let's move on to another kind of financial model, and that is contactless payments, which have moved on to using the mobile phone instead of just a credit card. So that's Apple Pay, Android Pay, and Samsung Pay. This is another example of data devaluation because the real story here is not the, you know, how the mobile phones are used for payments. It's the example of tokenization. So when you enroll a card onto any of these systems, um, what you're doing is you're not storing the card data on your phone. The banks are issuing you a, a token value that, is, that Apple and I think others people call a device account number that is actually stored on your phone. So Apple and iOS do, a, I would call it a ridiculous job of securing that device account number um, through a secure element in the NFC controller, through the secure enclave and all these layers of security because that's just what Apple does. Um, Samsung uses Trust Zone because that's kind of the mechanisms they have of Samsung Knox. But Android and Android Pay is actually kind of special for a couple of reasons. They use what's called host card emulation. That's pure software. And it is pure software methods used to protect that account number, um, not hardware security. It is just obfuscation, software anti-tamper, these other things, which work because this is a token value. And that's totally safe because the value of this, um, this, this device account number can't be used on a track for like a swipe transaction. It can't be used for an EMV transaction. So it has a limited value and can only be used on that device. And what that does is saying, basically says, well, we're just going to reduce the value of attack so we don't have to secure it as, as as well, which was their only option on the very diverse Android ecosystem. But what I predict we'll find is that it's not a problem because of the devaluation. <coughs> so let's talk more about Android security because this is actually one of my favorite topics. And it's also one of, my, one of the favorite topics of uh, the trade press as well. The big bone of the last year for Android was stage fright. This affected a billion devices. It was you know, really scary. It was exploitable over MMS. There's a lot of concerns that this was going to be a mobile worm that just shut down people's phones around the world and uh, ended life on this planet as we know it. Um, that's not the whole story. If you look at the Android OS fragmentation, you can see that, you know, one, people don't update their phones because the update model is um, it's slow. It doesn't actually work as well as... Things like iOS, where updates are applied very quickly. And if you look at this vulnerability, which affected Android 2.2 and later, <coughs> that's basically the entire graph at the far right, which was um, the distribution of versions when this vulnerability was, was, uh, was announced. But the world didn't end. And why was that? A few reasons. One was Google Play. So the attack surface in uh, Google Hangouts was fixed in an update to the app and pushed out you know, almost immediately. And what that did is because most devices um, now do auto updates of apps in the background, this attack surface was eliminated across the entire fleet within probably a couple weeks. Um, and that compressed window of vulnerability significantly reduced the value of that vulnerability to attackers. And this attack was actually very complicated, but a company called Northbit released a white paper and an exploit for it, and they were able to target it <coughs> excuse me, uh, to, the, to Android 5.01 on the Nexus 5. And this is their exploit for it. It has a number of parameters that must be tuned to that specific firmware version. 
and this is another kind of data parameters for the MP4 file that also has firmware specific addresses. <coughs> Now, the problem with all this is that this, because this exploitation is at the operating system level, it requires this tuning. Android's fragmentation is a massive security benefit. And this is where that diversity from being open source actually really helps. This, um, this exploit targeted, thank you, um, targeted just you know, one model, the Nexus 5, which is the, one of the small slivers, like kind of the, the dark purple in the upper left there, and that is, this graph is just all the different handset models, not the different firmware versions of those handset models. And this significantly increases the work factor. So that same vulnerability affects a billion devices, but requires a massive amount of time investment to develop something that will be useful to the attacker. <coughs> Sorry. I know. There's a, there's a flu going around. Um, so another, th another thing that I like to look at is DevOps. This is typically concern, you know, considered a threat to security. And there's a popular image going around of security cleaning up after DevOps. But DevOps isn't actually bad for security. It's really good. Because what it does, it brings a lot of these things that I mentioned before. Flux. <coughs> speed, containment, and immutability. So what this does... Yeah, let's try that out. Thank you. I'll let you talk amongst your... I'll let you ponder this for a second while I apply, apply this patch, see if it works. So the speed at which you can, thank you, at which you can respond, this is like DEF CON, everyone's just bringing you drinks. <laughs> um, the speed that you can respond and that you can rebuild your infrastructure and re a patch vulnerability <coughs> patch vulnerability all throughout your deployed applications is a huge benefit, especially when mo mo many modern enterprises don't even know where all their applications are. Having a DevOps pipeline where you can see where code goes to running infrastructure and make changes all along it is a massive security improvement compared to trying to inventory who owns all these servers, where did this code come from that's running on it. This application, we don't even know where this code is. We have to reverse engineer the code so that we can make a patch to it. There's all these difficult challenges that DevOps actually makes a lot better. So these are, these are why I look at the security benefits here. Again, that are not explicit security goals, but are just built into the model. So now I want to talk about what this means for the next billions and billions and billions of devices and Internet users. <coughs> I need a mute button. Um, or proverbially, the Internet of Things. Our first billion devices were, were PCs. And what we found with this was that devices that were meant to, were designed to be operated, you know, non-networked, in an isolated environment, when you connect them to the internet, had a lot of security threats. The next billions of devices were smartphones, and these solved a lot of those problems. <coughs> but we discovered more privacy issues because these are incredibly personal devices, and that was another set of problems that need to be solved. What I think we're going to see with the Internet of Things is that we need to decentralize trust. Because as we have a billion smart whatevers in our homes, um, having ultimate trust in all those manufacturers, I think, is going to become increasingly dangerous. And all those vendors will become increasingly enticing targets for attack when they have access to all the data gathered from those devices and access to all those devices. So if we can decentralize that trust, we can reduce that value and actually be safer overall. So there's a couple ways that I think we need to do that. 
First is we need an anchor of trust. So this is um, the anchor from a ship, the uh, USS uh, Hartford, which was, uh, which was used in the American Civil War. And uh, the captain yelled the famous phrase, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. At that time, torpedoes were, were water mines. He said, I don't care, just go straight through them, which is pretty much what we're doing with the Internet of Things and security. Having a secure hardware-based route of trust makes a lot of things a lot easier. And right now, our smartphone <coughs> is our most likely anchor. But there are other alternatives, such as um, Google ATAP's Trust Anchor, which is yet to be released, or something like a YubiKey, uh, something that is a weak HSM that you keep with you <coughs> that <coughs> can be used to bootstrap trust throughout your ecosystem. The other thing we need is what I call a totem. This is something that identi strongly identifies whether you're talking to real, that real hardware root of trust and not something that is emulated in software. These are typically in hardware called a physically unclonable function or a puff. And on iOS devices, this has been emulated or created with what's called the UID key, a per device unique key that means that is very difficult to extract from the device, and that is the root of a lot of trust. And you can make sure that you're talking to a real device. All attacks must be done on that device, not in a scalable cryptographic attack. And you also must have remote attestation in both directions. The device has to know it's really talking to its endpoints, not being emulated, and vice versa. The uh, backend infrastructure must know that the device or any other device that it's talking to are the true device, the real hardware, unmodified, untampered with, and not something that um, is a software emulator or been modified in any way. And the final ingredient that I think we really need to think about is how, the, um, how we decentralize the control and the sharing of data from these devices. Um, I don't believe that the kind of center-based model where everything has, you know, one company or has the infrastructure that controls all the nodes is scalable when we have billions of this and billions of that and billions of this and billions of that. I think what we're going to start to see are these devices being kind of grouped together into social network-like groups. And so we'll have social networks of devices instead of people with scoped data sharing to share data with a couple links deep among devices that you already trust. So you have, instead of having a circle of trust, you have a cloud of trust and data going either by or unidirectionally among these devices. And what that means is there's no central points where you can attack and get access to everyone's smart toaster because there's nothing that the world needs more than an attacker that can burn everyone's toast all around the world. And I think there are legitimate threats, but beyond that, it's turning any device that you own into a target of ransomware or something else. And I believe that having a more decentralized trust will prevent um, these enticing targets from being rich for these attacks and kind of degrading our quality of life when every single thing, every smart thing in our house just doesn't work. So uh, that is all I have. So you don't have to hear me cough anymore. If uh, anyone has any questions, I can take those now. Um, otherwise, I'll be here the next two days and at the lock note. And feel free to walk up to me and um, ask me any questions or ask them now. Thank you. Thanks for your talk. I'm Darren Pauly from the Register. Um, you just mentioned, like, you had that slide up with all the Android, the different Android flavors, and mentioned that that, if I've got it right, raised the attacks or the attack complexity, I suppose. Um, what, what would you think if you considered that so many of those devices would be unpatched because the manufacturers stop, you know, um, they, they have to obviously, like, release their own updates and so forth? How does that then um, affect the overall security, like having such a, a heterogeneous um, and, uh, yeah, environment, I suppose? Mm -hmm. well, from the security standpoint, I assume all those devices are unpatched because the, the process of patching Android systems is still very far, is 
not ideal yet. The monthly patch cycle just started a few months ago, and those are available on Nexus devices and I believe Samsung's. But for most of that ecosystem, they don't have that. So I assume that all those devices are unpatched. And so you get the security from just knowing that the value of a vulnerability that does exist and is unpatched is still very low because of the attacker effort required to turn it into a, a scalable attack. And they also have to counteract the ability of the, um, and the Google Play Store and Google Play services from using the Verify Apps functionality to identify malware across that entire ecosystem. So you, when you install an app, either um, through a store, a third-party store, or a sideload, it is scanned, and there's continuous scanning going on in the background so that once a, a potentially harmful app is identified, it is eliminated across the entire fleet. And so I believe for ecosystems like Android, we need to think less about particular vulnerabilities and about the vulnerability in the larger sense because that focus on a particular vulnerability is for the Microsoft of 2000 era. That's not the world we live in today, especially not on Android devices. So um, just one vulnerability is the first step in an attack. You need the vulnerability, you need the exploit, you need basically the rest of the post-exploitation stuff to achieve your objective, and the more of that that is expensive to the attacker um, that they have to reproduce, that they cannot share across, um, the less likely that an attack is going to be there. And if there's less value to that attack, I don't believe they'll invest in that infrastructure. Okay, so, so you would say um, for the next sort of stage fright that would come along, you would caution uh, against sort of hand-waving and things like that and, and suggest that the, the attack is not necessarily as... Um, or potentially that they, they are overstated and that there's a lot of mitigating factors there by the, by the fact that the ecosystem's so diverse. Is that right? I would say that patching is important. <laughs> And I believe that basically the things that we're doing in that ecosystem are the right steps. The monthly, monthly patch cycle is a move forward. Having um, less vulnerabilities in the software in the first place is a great step forward. Um, but we should not discount the other ecosystem effects that keep it safe. And the difference between safe and safety and security is, an, is a crucial one because there's a lot of things we do every day that are not secure. We are vulnerable to attack, but whether they are safe or not is another question. So I was just in Tokyo. And I was amazed at how few people chained their bikes up. Um, and I'm like, that is clearly not secure. That is a very expensive, device, very expensive bike with a very cheap lock that is not secure. However, the ecosystem and the threats make it so that it is a safe thing to do. And I believe that um, for the Android ecosystem in particular, these ancillary systems of Google Play services um, that auto-update, verify apps, and these other things that have been built into the platform um, make it a much safer ecosystem than it is commonly understood to be. And I believe that the data that Google had, that has been corroborated by Google from the, their statistics on Google Play Store from, um, uh, was it, uh, it was like Georgia Tech study looking at network traffic on a mobile carrier, looking for traces of um, uh, devices talking to um, known CNCs for malware, and also the data from the Verizon Data Breach Report all corroborate each other that the amount of ma malware in the mobile ecosystem is actually exceedingly low um, compared to what is um, described sometimes. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, Dino. Hey. Um, so I like all of your uh, sort of the angles at which you're approaching it, and I'm wondering, in sort of the world we're moving to with third-party outsource risk cloud providers, um, some of these options are, are not available to us. So can you maybe just talk really briefly, like, as a cloud provider, what options do they have and what options are precluded just by the nature of cloud? Sure. Um, what I think that we should ask for our cloud providers to do, and I think they should be moving towards, is having less access to customer data. Um, because uh, that takes down their risk of attack and their consequence significantly. And even things like, I'm going to say it, JavaScript cryptography, I believe are steps forward because overall it allows to create less data at risk um, and makes the vulnerability to be a directed attack versus an undirected mass attack against unencrypted data. So even though there are legitimate attacks against JavaScript crypto, they do not scale as well as sweeping up everyone's data once you've compromised um, a cloud provider or a 
um, or a other infrastructure. And one of the other things that JavaScript crypto and similar designs let you do is, tra- is encrypt at the client and send the data all across different tiers to your you know, more protected um, segments of your network. So you could say, I don't know, you use the JavaScript to encrypt to a public key for which the private key exists in an HSM, your backend data, struct- um, data centers, so that your entire web tier of application servers and web servers, which are your front lines of attack, never see plain text sensitive data. That the most sensitive data just completely bypasses them, and in order for an attacker to even um, gain a temporary position to observe it in transit, they have to get to the core of your network, not to the area of highest risk. Nowadays, I notice the trend moving from hardware-dependent security to software-only security because people believe in the flexibility mm-hmm. and ease of use. You mentioned that the trusted anchor. Do you think it is the right trend? So meaning the, the security with the HSM to the, the security without HSM or any other security measures? Just, just rely on the security, uh, the software security. Um, so I can repeat the, the question, make sure I understood it correctly. You said that there is a trend to move from hardware-based security towards software-based security because it's more flexible, you can adapt quicker. Is this the right thing for security to abandon ideas like HSMs for pure software approaches? Um, I don't believe in absolutes. Um, I believe that you should use both for their strengths. And so I believe that secure architectures include secure hardware, tamper response, and things like HSMs. But that's why I called them an anchor, that we should have, we should think of them as, you know, everyone should have a HSM, every individual should have an HSM-like device, it's probably going to be their smartphone, um, that is their anchor. And some secure physical devices can also be the cryptographic anchor. And then you use the adaptability of software to apply other security um, on top of that. And so now we don't have to have hardware security for everything at every tier. We can anchor it at either side and use flexibility of software in between so that we can move quickly and adapt um, while we still have um, some of the strongest benefits from hardware security at the two ends. I have time for one more question. Just don't do that. My question <laughs> is, uh, you, uh, you, ref, you raised about the IoT security. The, uh, the important thing is, is uh, decentralized, right? Yes. But, but uh, from my point of view, in future, most of the IoT device, for example, the home IoT device, are very, very low cost and uh, you know, cheap CPU and no power. They, they, they really depend on the uh, cloud. So that means you should have a central central cloud. So how, how do you implement this kind of uh, decentralized? Sure. So the question is, um, because IoT devices are very low cost, a lot of the, um, the, the intelligence of the devices will be put in the cloud so that the cost can remain low cost, or so the device can remain low cost. How do I implement this decentralized model with, at, at a low cost? Um, I, so there's... A, a couple things that I think would make that easier is that you know the if you decentralize and use sort of local wireless protocols like Zigbee, those are cheaper components than something that can speak full you know 802.11 and have a full TCP stack, and that lends itself closer to kind of decentralization than to a centralized kind of um, central node model. The other thing that I think is going to be increasingly important for the user experience of smart devices is latency. And because with a physical device, we want it to respond instantly. And we want it to feel very fluid like the physical device, pure physical analog device that's replacing. You can't have that if it's talking to a server all the way across the Internet for everything that you're doing. And so I think that the um, sort of putting more intelligence on the device, while it does increase the cost, will increase that, will improve that user experience as well. Um, And these are things that, we're going to see different vendors play out. And in particular, I call it the Google model versus the Apple model, you know, where the nexus of control for the device is. 
Google favors in the cloud, Apple favors you know, on the device. And other smart devices are going to um, lean more towards one model or the other. And we'll let the market figure out what um, has the best benefits. But um, I believe that, you know, to answer also Jeff's question of what happens when you lose that device, you think about like, what happens when I lose my password to, um, uh, to my Facebook account? I can have one of my friends restore access to it. And you know, I, I choose my trusted friends, and like, two of them um, cooperating can give me back, act, back access to my account. So for a decentralized model where I lose my phone, um, a couple of my neighbors, a couple of other my trusted um, peers can collaborate in order to restore my key for my trust anchor, for my anchor of trust. So I think there's a lot of potential um, designs there, and I look forward to seeing kind of what people try out and what actually happens. All right, anyone has anything else, please come up and talk to me. Our, thank you.